much, Judy, and I'm delighted to be here and meet you all, and I hope we'll have a chance to talk later. So what I'm going to do is just give a... Uh, it's not going to be specific about any of the projects. I'm going to talk about my world. <laughs> I'm going to talk about Groundwork Gallery, which, which Judy has just mentioned, but also a little bit about culture of the countryside. But I hope, in a way, that I'm going to make some general points about the need to work across disciplines, which everyone's here doing, the need to combine words and art and reflections and looking um, and looking at extreme detail. So th those are my general threads that I'll be picking up here and there. But I couldn't resist starting with this, um, <laughs> which um, is one of those really eccentric but very normal things that happen in the countryside. <laughs> and Stradset is near um, Kings Lynn, where I've come from. And it just is full of extraordinary, funny kind of incident, like the stumped monkeys, motorbike stunts, <laughs> the world of wings, Zulu dancers, <laughs> rural crafters, Gemma's petting zoo, amazing reptiles, rocky mountain horse, chainsaw carving. So there's art in there. <laughs> there's, there are, there's nature, in a way. There aren't any plants, but there's shopping. Um, and fun dog. <laughs> it's just full of amazing, amazing things. Um, and it's, it, it is cross-disciplinary in, in its own way. And, and, but it's, and it's very much a popular culture in the countryside kind of thing that you probably see everywhere, but that was a particularly eccentric version of it. So I came across it in the context of my Culture of the Countryside project, and that um, is the book it led to in the end. It was a heritage lottery funded project that I ran quite a few years ago. I worked at the University of East Anglia. And the point of it was to, it was, because it was heritage lottery, we had to look at our local heritage as the core part of what we were doing. But it started from the perspective of having at my, the gallery I worked in a collection of art from Papua New Guinea. That's a rather a dark slide, but at the back there you see a group of children holding an object from Papua New Guinea. And it was one of these very random things that happens in museums. A, a British council um, opera, a, a, man, a British council administrator gave a collection of 150 objects from Papua New Guinea to the museum, to the art gallery. And none of us had ever been there or were ever likely to. We didn't know what really to do with this material. We thought, well, let's use it for asking questions about that, what, what, what Papua New Guinea is and, and what it tells us and what it made, makes us reflect on that's relevant to where we are. So it was really looking at the here and, the here and there, um, making comparisons from another perspective and in order to understand ourselves better. So cross-disciplinary thing was at the heart of it, but also cross-cultural. It was very important because also East Anglia, our part of East Anglia, I don't know about over this way, is quite insular, quite traditionally insular, not very, very little migration, immigration. But it's, it's changed actually in the last, in the last five, even in the last five years. But, but still, you go out into the villages and there's nobody of colour at all. Um, there's no, so everyone thought initially that these brown objects came from Africa. Um, whereas, you know, so we, we had to start by thinking about Papua New Guinea. And there's a little girl holding the thing <laughs> saying Papua New Guinea and Norfolk, <laughs> which is one of the things they all learned. So um, the, and, and they, what they did in the end was they made um, their own reflections on where they were from, inspired by those objects. So a lot of the objects were to do with rituals, were to do with celebrating a place, had patterns on that came from the understanding of the way, say, water ripples, um, or, or scales on a fish, or a bird, shape of a bird. And so children made their own rituals. And so there, there we are in a, um, in, the, in a tiny, tiny village school in Suffolk with a group of children who'd made their own um, poems and reflections. Or well, they made pictures of their landscapes, um, but, but very different from what they would normally have done. That was what was so striking about mm -hmm. the work, starting from looking from elsewhere. They came up with entirely original work that came with, with different perspectives. Mm. We also did community reflections. So we had, this was in a big cafe, an art center in the middle of Suffolk. We did a big map 
um, well, a, an artist painted that for us, and we, we people put pins in to put hang on their um, what they thought the countryside meant to them with with luggage tags. So we got that was the, the beginning of the project. The end, it was absolutely covered in luggage tags. When people said, well, in fact, these were the artist's perception was that all the cycle routes. Um, that's where we started from with that map. Um, so we had an awful lot of and. The other thing, and that's, I think, relevant to <coughs> what we're thinking about today, was this was a project that, right at the end of looking at culture of the countryside, we were commissioned by somebody else um, to do a, a project about setting up a creative group around the Little Ooze River, which forms the border of Norfolk and Suffolk. And what was absolutely key to this project was the unspectacular landscape. And there were lots of little damp patches and little damp fields and things that were um, very precious wetland places, but went completely unnoticed. And our job was really to work with photographers and textile people and painters and poets, musicians, uh, to, to look at these, what people had classed as unspectacular landscapes. And that's the source of the little ooze, which we, we had to track down and find because no one had really pinpointed where it was. Um, so noticing extreme detail was really at the heart of all of this work. And then I left, I left the Sainsbury Centre, opened my gallery. Um, and as Judy said, it's the only one in the country dedicated to the environment, which is quite surprising. It's called Brownwork Gallery. Um, and because I, my original background, I worked in the environment movement. Um, so I sort of knew about pressure groups a bit and then, then was working in education, working in communities. So it's all pretty much come together there. So everything that gets shown there, the contemporary art exhibitions, leads to talking about it. And that, for me, is absolutely important, that every work of art opens up a new way of talking. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's from bird after bird, which I'll show you in a minute, came here, thanks to Lina came near here. So this was um, a work by an artist called Jane Ivy Mee, who had documented all the birds on the red list and made these effigies. And she went into archives and looked up and, and modeled them in, in clay, having really drawn them accurately. And then she made these semi-abstracted images in drawings and, and, um, and we displayed the white birds on the black table. And it did feel like a memorial and people were very moved by that. Um, and this work has been shown quite a lot in uh, different contexts now. Um, and I think at the moment it's actually in Yorkshire, um, at Harwood, or one of those big houses that does exhibitions. Um, and that led to, um, there, there, in fact, there's Jane down at the bottom. It led to a lot of talking. And there's a, um, at the top left as, um, a picture of some, <laughs> there were photographs by Milo Newman, who's talking about them there. And they were photographs of skeins of geese in, in Norfolk, photographed at night because, and so they were black, black birds against a black background, um, which was kind of a, you know, a kind of specialist thing, but, but also very intriguing that you know, he'd had to sit up all night to get these very, in, in fact, striking images, but very, very subtle. Um, so that it came to what was then the steel rooms in Brick, thanks to Lina. <laughs> and there you see at the back there, um, Jane's Table of Birds um, and the work at the front by um, Patrick Haynes. Um, so that was one way it moved on. So then, um, and the, this is, I haven't given the chronology correctly, but I'm giving examples of ways in which what I've been trying to do in the gallery is start with themes that then lead to discussion and lead then to activity. So this was one about wood, which actually was inspired by the Woodland Trust's um, campaign for trees. And I became a champion for trees in, in Kings Lynn. And that led to um, an event, tree, Tea for Trees. And then we, in fact, this is the easiest bit of fundraising, which I'll pass on to you. Um, we were told it would cost 600 pounds to plant enough trees for a season in Kings Inn. So we thought, okay, well, let's, let's chunk that up and, and ask people for 60 pounds each. Um, 
and get, well, we only need 10 people. And so we had a tea and we got that straight away, that money, um, and gave people a, my graphic designer to sign a, 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 a little certificate, which people got. Um, and <laughs> because we were then dependent on the council to plant the trees, and what is the, everyone talks about, everyone's very much in favor of planting trees. The problem is trying to find available land particularly in a town mm. where they will go and we just couldn't in time and within that year clear enough because some of the roads belong to because we were happy we wanted it to be street trees um it was at the time when sheffield was not cutting down mm. trees we wanted to do the reverse so um we, they had to go in the end at the edge of a park near a street rather mm. because all the streets were Access was owned by the county council, not the local council. You know, there's all that business you have to deal with, which takes a lot of time. So when the government says, oh, we're going to plant thousands and thousands of trees, it's very complicated. Um, then bugs. So this was another, um, this was an amazing work, a film by a Dutch artist, um, where he, he, that's him, under a swarm of bees. Um, he worked with some beekeepers in Ireland and they filmed him being swarmed on by bees until he was completely covered. Um, and he didn't have a single sting at the end of that mm -hmm. thing. Um, and the other work on that screen is by Swiss artist Cornelia Hess Honiger, who um, documented de deformation to bugs in the um, areas of nuclear power plants around the world, and, and she found these extraordinary stunted creatures. I don't know, I might have another image. No, I haven't got another, that's the mayor. <laughs> um, um, and then, the, yeah, there were, there were paintings, but, um, so there were paintings of, of plagues and swarms, but, so it was really that, that was having talked to people about this, what they felt about bugs, including bug specialists, they said, People are a little bit scared of them. They love them, but they're a little bit scared of them. So that, and that was reflected in the art. You know, quite a lot of it was a bit creepy. People, <laughs> um, But then, you know, everyone at one stage was talking about the fact that you used to get swarms of flies on the windscreen when you drove, drove and you don't do anymore. But one of the paintings was that. So we had lots of conversations in the gallery about how, you know, we, that, that used to be like that, but it isn't anymore. Um, we worked with Bug Life. Um, while I was setting up the exhibition, I heard um, someone from Bug Life talking on the radio about um, they were setting up this Bee Lines project, um, working with councils to try and plant, um, put, have areas of planting linked up around the country so that um, pollinators could move around freely um, from one to the other. And I contacted them, they replied immediately, and then work, we worked together. And th there we are, sitting around my table in the gallery and also in a, a, ta a, a town cafe, talking to council councillors and council operatives about setting up a beeline in King's Inn. Hasn't quite yet happened, but I'm sure it will. So that's one of the things I've always tried to do, was do some, some kind of campaigning or some kind of activity which makes a difference environmentally um, stemming from the art. And here we are. This was the project we did um, with Harriet and Judith, um, Outfalls Tyler. In fact, the, the um, heart of this project was an exhibition downstairs, Crystal Labas, regarding nature. She's a wonderful photographer who made two meter long photographs of marsh plants having done research at the Natural History Museum. Um, and before I, I've got a picture of that in a minute, but before I go to that, um, oh, and then, yeah, uh, that's, so <laughs> Judy and Harriet um, talking, that's the upstairs in the gallery and some of their work. And it became what I, another thing I've always tried to do, and it's a small place, groundwork, but somehow it's somewhat elastic. Mm. Um, and what I've always tried to do is have a family of projects so that there, there are four different things all relating to each other, which means each project can talk to the other and it becomes in itself a cross-disciplinary activity. Um, and there we are talking, and that's, that's one of Crystal Bass, well, you can't pick any, it's three metres long, you don't get any sense of that, but it would fill this whole wall. Um, 
and they were, they're all taken at dusk and there's something quite moody and beautiful about them. Um, and they, yeah. So again, they were very much a talking point. And then we had, a con we had lots of conferences actually and talks and worked with the Norfolk Wildlife Trust, um, did some talks uh, in North Norfolk at their um, visitor centre and here we are, the beamed building is in Kings Lynn, a very beautiful 15th century hall where we had um, a conference, Eco Poetry. Um, so the most recent show, which I just finished and closed, is called Fieldwork. And that was working with artists who made fieldwork their um, main um, aim over a couple of years, working in pairs, but not actually meeting, but working across um, distance to think together about, about work. And they were thinking about nature and the urban environment. And this was one of them, um, Kim Norton, who's a, actually a potter. They were all potters, but had diversified. She had a dead apple tree in her garden in London and a tree care book and researched what, and, and realized there's a lot of craft in the care of trees and grafting and binding mm -hmm. and splinting and so forth. So she made an installation about the craft of trees. And again, that led to a lot of conversations with people about their gardens, about the state of trees, about tree diseases, and, and so that. Um, and here's another artist from Scotland who made work about, this is Annie Woodford, um, who was, the, her, was Kim's actually research partner. Her work is about lichen, but these were all tiny, tiny, tiny um, works, mostly in porcelain, and there's some real pieces of lichen in there, but. Um, but she researched um, the botany, she worked um, in the um, Royal Botanic Gardens, she then did field work in her, her area in Scotland, so it was a very intense experience. Also looking at them, you know, people could see that depth of research in her work. And here we are, um, do, we did some artist walks, and here we are with John Rogers, who's a, a, walk, a walker, a specialist walker. Um, an explorer. He calls himself a flaneur, but he's he's got a cult website, um, and the name's just temporarily escaped me. But anyway, he's if you look up John Rogers, it will crop up. Um, and he he does a walking he does a, a weekly blog, um, and he's an extraordinary man, and and was talking about the understanding of place um, through what he plans his walks very carefully, but looks not only at what's obvious but what was there once and what so what the place represents that used to be there and I recommend you get him to come and talk to you because he was very inspiring and then we did a walk with him um the far mm, I'm trying to remember his thing it's the far something anyway look him up and you'll find him I'm definitely going to have him back and there we are we did a not a walks with the artists looking at trees um, with and um, that was a kind of called the artistic forager, and then we did some work in e with a group of eco poets, with two eco poets, and a group of poets, um, and here they are, um, reading in a circle, reading back the work they've done over the day, and there's the work they made um, around Kim, Kim's work, and actually some students from College of West Anglia. Um, I, I was listening to the method the poets were using and told the students, and then the students did one, um, which they didn't, they were too shy to be photographed, but they were brilliant. And they came up with such fantastic, actually just as good as this. Um, and it, it started with a very simple device of, um, I asked them to look at a work and think of the first word that came to them. And then they had to go back and look at and then think of the second word, because always the odd second reflection is better than your first. <laughs> the first one's usually banal, but then you get deeper and deeper. And so that's what they did, and they, they just came up with amazing, amazing phrases. And thinking about words, again, during lockdown, um, and going back to the idea of being specific about what you see and being attentive to detail, I did a project on Instagram called My Doorstep Environment, because everyone during lockdown was doing local walks and noticing nature. I thought, well, let's push it a little bit further and get people to write a bit more about that and think about their environment that they're, that's on their doorstep. 
and the doorstep environment hashtag had not been taken on Instagram. So that was, and hundreds of people took part in it. And so what, what I, I gave up these prompts one a day and then and posted an image that related to them and some text and everyone else did the same, sent it to the hashtag doorstep environment. And we had a, yeah, had amazing, again, amazing responses. Then people said, oh, let's do it again. It was so great. So I did, but made it weekly and almost no one took part. <laughs> <laughs> Just, um, I think it had its moment. So again, what, what's just about to open now is extraction. And I won't talk about this, I think, but this is just the um, something I've done now for two years um, relating to a huge American initiative where they extract resources out of the earth um, very freely because they don't have planning or, and you know, there's a lot of commercial backing for, you know, everything from fracking to things like the Alberta tar sands, and you see this absolute devastation to the landscape. And a group of writers and artists in America set up this extraction. It's called Extraction Art on the Edge of the Abyss. And um, there were about 50 organizations and artists or more involved in it, and I got to hear about it through a friend of Vincent King's Lynn, in fact, and joined it, and it turned out I was the only one outside America. And they produced a big catalogue with a map of America with all these organisations. And then there was UK with Brown Work Gallery, and that's true. <laughs> so it made me feel very proud, but also feeling, God, that means we really do have to work hard at this. Um, and while they were looking at things like you know, the Berkeley Pit, which was an absolutely polluted lake, we were looking at quarrying. Um, in our locality, and I felt the way to deal with these huge problems we can't conceive of and can't do much about is to come very local and look at what resources are locally, which kind of brings me back to what we're here for today. Um, because if you notice and are attentive to what's going on in your locality, that's the way to start, and then the bigger problems will, we hope, somehow sort themselves, or, or we, we then we form a network which then can join another network and then we make the work we're doing bigger. I think that's me done. There we go. Uh, that's new. Look, signpost, Groundwork Gallery in the town. <laughs> that means I've arrived. <laughs> 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 <laughs>